one of the legends of the game loses back-to-back -back eliminations and maybe a third one coming. Plus, we're all Anissa asking, please let us off this Tori and Jordan ride. Devin stays the best at pulling daggers and dropping bars. TJ puts bananas in his place. MTV's music choices are so on point, I thought it might be 2004 all over again. Chauncey won't jump the eliminated return. And my guy Fessel, he gets himself some W's. That's right, it's the challenge. Ride or Dies episode 14 recap coming up right now. What up, my fellow challenge lovers? Welcome to The Challenge Historian, where we dive deep into all things MTV's The Challenge, past, present, or future. If it's happening in the Challenge universe, then we are here to document it. I am your host and dedicated Challenge Historian, Jacob Hollaball. Thank you so very, very much for joining me here tonight to discuss the 14th episode of Ride or Dies, the season that will never die in. You know, as much as I maybe joke about how long this season seems like it's going to continue to be, more challenge the better, I say. So I get it. And yes, a few of you who have DM'd me about joking so much about the length of this season, you're all correct. The more challenge, the better for most of us, but also at the same time. It's, it gets a little it gets a little egregious, and when it's because of all the twists and the turns that makes it as long as it is, there's possibly a better version that is, in fact, shorter. But anyways, that's not really a topic tonight. We've talked about it enough. We'll talk about it at the end of the season. That's when the appropriate time to discuss the length of a season is. But as for tonight, it's just episode 14, Ride or Dies, recapping it. That's what we're here to do. Quick programming reminders before we begin. This is the only podcast of this particular week. Next week, we will have Ride or Dies again on Wednesday night. And then the Season 39 Fantasy Cast that I maybe probably did actually on record promise you that would come out last week. Did not. Wasn't able to pull that off. So that will be next Friday, a week from this Friday, nine days from when this podcast is recording. So just the one this week to next week and then after that we will see we're going to first find out how many episodes of rider dies there are when the world championship starting all of that when survivor starting factor that in a whole bunch of stuff but the new reloaded 2023 schedule will be upon us soon enough and i'll let you know what it is when i make that decision so that's that this is the only pod of the week it's the only pod to talk about right now so we might as well get into it right away episode 14 ride or dies starting with the storyline discussions then the awards then the power rankings the predictions you know how we do let's dive in let's go as has been the case for a couple episodes there is only one place really to start and i'm just gonna make this super super quick because like Anissa, like I'm sure you are feeling this way, possibly at home, most of you. If you're not, if you're feeling opposite of what I'm about to say, please DM me. Let me know. Let me know why, what the entertainment value is for you, what you're enjoying or just enthralled by. I hope you're not like enjoying it, enjoying it. But that's Tori and Jordan. Um, and honestly, uh, I really don't want to talk about it. Um, I also, spoiler for predictions, not a real spoiler, I do not know what happens next week, but a spoiler for the predictions at the end of the podcast, I'm assuming that Jordan's going to lose next week, his third elimination in two, 24 hours of real time and in one and a half episodes, um, and is going to go home, and this isn't going to be something that this, the story just comes right back at us next week. We can only hope, uh, as much as I love Jordan and would like to see him do well in the game. We can only hope that uh, he and Anissa end up losing. And I can't believe I'm in a position where I'm rooting for Big Ken and Casey to knock out Jordan and Anissa from the game for all of our viewing pleasure. But uh, that's kind of where, kind of where I'm at. But uh, I really don't want to talk about Tori and Jordan. I'm not going to talk about almost anything of it. Really, the like specifics of it, the fight and the interrogation, super uncomfortable gross not i'm mean, not gross no one did any i don't know i i understand why they're both acting the way they are they both have these incredible strong emotional feelings traumatic experiences being is kind of happening before our eyes like some level of traumatic experience here and uh yeah i'm just kind of this way i've been the last few weeks in this whole season about this particular storyline 
I like both people involved. I find it a little bit cringy because I am rooting for both of them and they're both at different points. Maybe right now in this moment, I'd say Jordan's maybe the one acting a little more, you know, not on his best, uh, at his best self. And Tori's just kind of trying to deal with it, but they both, you know, from what we know, public knowledge wise, at least, you know, this relationship was not a one sided one person, you know, had issues they couldn't overcome or anything like that. So I really don't want to talk about it much more. All I will say is uh, he did call you a terrorist on national television. So vote his ass in. I'm probably giving him a vote. I'm, pro- I'm probably doing the vote. Uh, it's it's nice. It's a reconciliation, you know, a nice little olive branch that she doesn't. But he called you a terrorist. <laughs> like, it's pretty brutal. Like, it's pretty brutal to be called a terrorist on national television by your ex-fiance. It's probably deserving of one vote into an elimination that he's got a 50-50 shot of going into anyways and that the rest of your team wants to. And also, while we're on it, because I won't probably bring it up anywhere else, Olivia, what what, what, what are you doing? What, what, what's going on here? What's with the burn vote? What, what's with the Chauncey vote? No one else is voting for Chauncey. You're obviously not voting for your ride or die because you're a real ride or die. And I respect that and love that about you and Horacio. But uh, you kind of got to throw the vote on Jordan if you want any chance of saving your guy Horacio. That just went totally under the radar, which good for you know her and them that that gets to go under the radar. But uh, just had to give that a quick shout out. And also, the only real thing I will say on Tori and Jordan isn't actually about them. It's about the fact that I don't think I'm alone uh, I'm, I'm, we know it. Anissa there is sick and tired of all of it and being the mediator and everything. And I think it's been pretty consensus, like strong majority for sure. If not full blown, like heavy consensus online, um, from different commentators and personalities and even other cast members and definitely just kind of the fandom at large that no one's having a great time with this storyline. And I think it's one of those things. It's a, it's an example. Well, I don't, I'll maybe have this conversation again at the end of the season and we do the season recap, but to kind of start it, plant the seeds for that conversation I want to have, because this, this idea isn't fully formed in my head, this thought, this theory, whatever the, the basis of it. And I may be way off base here, just thinking about it out loud, but the, the mature version of MTV's the challenge, which I think we've find we've entered is, you know, we're in the like kind of mature MTV and certainly the like mature challenge which is good for so many reasons that we've tried to document very well as we did, you know, the first 20 seasons of the recap series during the last calendar year. Um, But we're in this kind of mature, we know they've not shown a lot of fights and drama from this season. You know, they're trying to stay, basically seems like they're staying away from all of that. And this very kind of mature adult, let's watch it. It's okay. We can see it. We can watch it. But then like, let's check in on like, you know, like bananas of all people is the one going in like, Hey, how's your mental health doing? Like, how are you feeling after all that went down? You know, we have the very incredible and like wonderful and vulnerable, awesome moments of Tori talking about the pain she's went through the therapy she's went through the antidepressants she's on things like that, which is powerful and good and awesome. But as like a small byproduct of that is that the kind of like, if this is the drama that they're now okay with showing versus what we maybe a version of this we'd had in the past. And obviously I'm not talking about any of that, like across the line untoward bullshit, horrible things that have happened in the past, but like the one-to-one comparison or really one-to-one-to-one comparison I would make of this is we've seen fiancés or ex fiancés on this show before. And like when Wes and Johanna were ex fiancés and Johanna threatened him, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, like she only threatened you with a vote or whatever. Like Johanna threatened Wes with the deed to the house he paid for, but put in her name because they were together. And I don't know, maybe she had better credit or whatever, but like that was so fun and it was very entertaining. And it was partially how they were both like kind of handling it. And they both handled it like, maturely immaturely if that makes any sense at all but i don't know like that was super entertaining but then we had while they were never ex fiancés at the time they are now unfortunately uh you know ex husband and wife we had brad and tori where tori gave the ring back to brad on uh i'm not it was ruins or cutthroat or i'm a horrible historian thinking this off the top of my head right now but i know that like that's a storyline i remember but it was also it was one more close to this jordan and tori where i'm like Uh, like I kind of in the moment, like, like both of these people. And I don't really love, 
I'm not entertained by this. I'm not interested. I'm not excited by any of this. So, um, you know, I guess they, they, this missed or this didn't work in the past as a storyline, but it also worked incredibly well as a storyline in the past. And I just feel like, you know, again, I'll come back to this conversation when I clearly have more thought out thoughts than what I've just spewed for the last two minutes here. But it feels like this is kind of the place this show might be in that even when we get this like crazy, un, you know, messy, wild storyline that is really painful and really traumatic for the people that are actually going through it in the moment. There's like no good way to both highlight it and make it like interesting or entertaining. Like we're all just kind of acting like Nisa and like we want off this ride. So I'll workshop whatever I was just trying to say in the last couple minutes. Cause I don't know that I made any real point there and I might've sounded like an idiot or offensive or something somehow. I don't even know. So I'm just going to stop talking because I think that's what you want <laughs> as far as this topic goes. And it's what I want as well. We'll get to predictions later, but let's kind of weirdly hope that Jordan and Nisa go home and we don't have to talk about this topic anymore. Next up, the Daily Challenge. That had to be fun. That has to be a good time to talk about, right? Nah, not really. Uh, honestly, Daily Challenge left me wanting in a big, big way. Didn't really have that much fun with it. Kind of almost any at all. I felt like it was ultimately as far as nighttime off the side of a building goes, this was about as boring as it gets. Uh, and I hate to say that. I, it's one that does register high on the, like, I would love to try this. I would love to do this. This could be in the challenge theme park, challenge slash survivor theme park, where I get to go with my friends and do the games of these shows I love watching. Um, definitely all in for that would be a great time, but uh, pretty boring to actually watch on TV. And I mean, no one even fell. And usually it's like, man, they just want people to fall. And they think that's like the most entertaining thing in the world. But like, yeah, it would have been something in this one. So, yeah, um, was tough. Uh, definitely kind of a tough one. And also, really got to say, I've got a couple quick notes on it, but this better not be the only nighttime challenge because they have to, have to, have to, have to do the Spooky Town Challenge. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you didn't watch Challenge USA or Challenge Australia, I implore you. Both seasons are worth watching, but definitely go watch Challenge Australia. The links are out there. It's a great, great season. Um, but in both of those, they do a specific nighttime challenge where they go to like this fake abandoned town that they have set up somewhere. They have to swim across the water to get to it. And then they have two hours in this town to do little puzzles, collect points. And it's kind of endurance slash puzzle. It's fun. It's entertaining. And it's been very, it's been like a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal daily challenge in both of those seasons. And I thought that's what we were going to get when I, you know, TJ's come in, maybe a nighttime challenge, but no, it's not. So please let this not be the only time we're doing one at night. Please let them do the spooky town challenge. Only other thing to say about the daily challenge, Chauncey quitting. I get it, but like, damn, bro, like you got to try. You're a fan of the show. You know what it's going to be. You're coming in dating the person who's been there. One has done a couple of seasons, plenty enough to have been some heights in her day. You like the show, you watch the show, you know about the heights. You've done it once before. You did this exact same drop. You did one where not only you had to hang off the side of the same building, but you were forced to hang and then drop. That was part of the, the thing is that you had to drop. So you've done it already. So you got to do it. You got to do it. And, uh, you know, it, again, kind of similar to the Olivia Byrne vote gone slightly wrong a little bit, or at least would have put all the pressure on Tori instead of actually in the end, kind of no pressure. Um, you've got to, you've got to do it and, you know, it kind of gets blown over by everything else going on in the episode. So good for him. But final thing on that TJ shout out to TJ. There's a lot of TJ talk coming up in the very near future on this podcast, starting right now because TJ has learned he's, he's adapted. He's molded. He used to be the, like, we hate on quitters. I hate on quitters. It's all we do. Hardline stance on quitters in recent seasons. We've seen him probably with some direction from production being like, Hey, you know, we're a little more family friendly here now. Like we're a little more like, empathetic to the people and the cast members. So maybe can you like tone it down? And we've seen and tone it down to where we're like, wait, TJ hates quitters. Where's TJ hating quitters. That's a staple. 
when that happens, when someone quits, we need TJ to read them the riot act. And we've got a couple good moments of it. You know, the Arissa moment on all stars one, um, but you know, he's kind of softened it up here or there. And I feel like this was an amazing moment where TJ has learned how to thread the needle. He, he gives it to Chauncey a little bit, but does so in an encouraging fashion from the stars. Like, Hey, you can't quit. You can do this and gives him like the encouraging. But then with each sentence, there's kind of like three to four levels of it from TJ. He gets more and more of like, Hey, I started off pure encouragement, pure, like you can do this. I believe in you. We believe in you. And he ends it with, ah, come on. Like, come on, man. You've already done this. You've got to be able to do it. And kind of like does read him the ride act like a little bit, like the most allowable ride act that you get read on MTV in 2023. So amazing adaptability from TJ. I think he's really thread the needle. I think this is exactly what it is, should be, and is also deserved. It's awesome. Be empathetic, pump them up, give them their best chance, give them time to overcome, have everyone come to their aid, the other teams room for them, and then they still won't do it. Blow that horn, show some disappointment, and keep it moving. Loved it. Vessel and Casey get the win. I just, I'll use this opportunity to once again say and maybe expound on slightly further. I so badly wish that these two were just a pair and partners this season and they had the whole house against them and it was just like they have to win a daily or they're going into elimination where they got to win and it would just been the best possible version of this season to get everyone out there who despises to some degree these two on this show you know like at least invested in them as characters to root against and i just it would have been so much better for the show and for them i think they would have fucking dominated as we see here they win yes fessy got to go twice that's a massive advantage and again also side note uh their team yet again massive advantage with more people they get one more person to go and because they have you know, it just turns into like Fessel gets to go twice and Nani gets to go twice and they both do really well. Their second runs are the better ones and they both do game plan really well. I'll give both teams props for st strategy wise being like, you know, maybe the other team, I maybe go with Jordan, like go Nani, go with Horacio first and then Jordan second. Either way, put the person you're going second with, with their best possible partner. So you give the best possible duo last going last. Really, really smart. But anyways, uh, Casey and Fessy get the win. There's so many casting what ifs with this season, but this is number one for me. Those two would have been partners. There's no Anissa there. There's no Kenny there. The Vacation Alliance doesn't really exist without Anissa there and um, with Casey and Fessy being partnered. It turns into Casey and Fessy with Bananas and Nani as like their little power four and probably the rest of the house against them with Tori and Devin knowing like, we're on the bottom of those two between those two teams. We're third. We got to turn the tables. They maybe would have been more interested in a Jay and Michelle, an Amber and Chauncey, what have you. This is the this is the casting what if that uh, I'm going to live with for a long time because I think it just would have been really, really great. Let's talk eliminations. Yes, plural, because there was two. And real quick, super quick. The decision of who to throw in is totally whatever. It's a 50-50 shot if Devin draws the safe dagger and is safe and you get Harassi over Jordan or not. And so, yeah, I would have thrown in Jordan. I wouldn't have burned my vote if I was if I was Olivia and I would have voted for Jordan if I was Tori. Sure, but ultimately, it doesn't really matter. It's a 50-50 shot. You get the matchup you want. Otherwise, it's a 50-50 shot that Devin is going home. So that is just kind of what it is. Or not going home going into the you know next elimination the next day but anyways let's get back to the first one so you walk in by the editing if you're keeping counts like confessionals and things like i am you're very certain when they walk into that arena it's like well it's balls in that's amazing and it's more amazing because it's jordan versus horacio based on the edit of the episode Devin got a couple moments to be funny and good at television, like Devin always does, but the story was about those two. It was very clear those were the two that were going to end up in there. We get this matchup. It looks on paper. You're like, holy shit, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be, this is exactly what we want. This is what we sign up for. This is what we watch for, an elimination like this. And it was really, really, really fun. It was a very good, very entertaining 
elimination. It just wasn't, I, I set my expectation. The moment we saw it was balls in and I knew from the edit, like the moment we saw balls in, I was like Jordan versus Horacio. I put in my notes, Jordan versus Horacio and balls in. Let's go. That's what I wrote. hundred percent confidence. Devin was not going to be involved in any way. So amped. And so I maybe set the expectation a little too high that it couldn't quite live up to that is like, we're about to get an all time classic classic. And it was very good. It was very fun. Horacio. Wow. Five and oh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but we also, this is where these twists backfire. You know, what would have been more fun if I actually thought that the loser of Jordan versus Horacio was going home and didn't know that like, huh, we're only 55 minutes into this episode and huh, we've already seen that these people's partners have not actually left the game. They're in some redemption house and huh, Horacio and Jordan, both of their ride or dies are still in the game. So Whoever loses this is just literally going to walk right back in when TJ reveals that those people haven't gone home yet. So that this is where those you think all, all these twists, all these moments. And yes, we do get eventually a pretty good moment out of the twist. We'll talk about that later. But it ruins something like this. Like I'm like this. There's no stakes. There's very minimal little stakes. Yes. Ultimately, this is going to toss Jordan and Anissa their game. I think I'm predicting. And again, I do not know. This is just my firm prediction. I just feel really like they sucked every last bit out of the Tori and Jordan thing for a reason and uh, that they're going to ultimately lose next week. We'll get to that again in predictions. But um, yeah, we knew whoever lost wasn't actually eliminated. So that ruined it a little bit. And also, did there maybe seem to be some new rules that we, we weren't privy to as fans that maybe aren't regular rules of balls in? Because it seemed, it sure seemed... Like, no one was allowed to go for the ball, which is strange. But, like, I could see that maybe possibly being a rule that they put in because Jordan was playing. And, like, Jordan is, for the most part, the whole time. It might have been a strategy or might have just been the most effective way for him to do it. But, like, he's one hand, like, one hand carrying that ball the whole time. And, uh, yeah, it seemed like, you know, Horacio does hit the ball out. The one time he, they, he gets the stop. He does hit the ball out, but it's like with his knee kind of on accident. And the, there's both times, both of them are like constantly swinging the ball way out, holding it one handed, like way out to the side when they're wrestling and falling down. They're both very clearly like going for the hips and the legs. And I don't know. It just felt a little like, are there some random rules here? Also, they didn't tell us in advance that like what the dead ball rules are. Sometimes if you drop the ball, it's over. Sometimes the ball has to go out of the ring. Sometimes it's something completely different, but they didn't tell us. And I just, I'm kind of tired and fed up with the whole not knowing the rules thing. But ultimately, um, you know, I really loved watching it. It was an incredible matchup. It's, it's an A. I did the wrong thing of setting expectations at A++. And then you get an A and you're like, I'm not even enjoying this A as much as I should. But it's an A. It's incredible. It's wonderful. It's awesome. But also they ruined it a little because there was no stakes to this. And uh, yeah, so I liked it. It was obviously way better than Enzo versus David from Challenge USA. But I will say, and for those of you who have still not watched Challenge Australia, shame, shame, shame. You should. Sugar versus Emily, which was half of an elimination battle of in Balls In on Challenge Australia. Go go look that one up. Very good battle between those two women. And I would take it, honestly, probably over this Horacio versus Jordan. But I still really, 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 really liked it. Horacio, by the way, got him some moves. Damn, boy. Like, shimmy, shimmy, shaking out there. Just all over the place. Putting the moves on. Also, very smart, strategic. When you not outsmart Jordan, but like use good strategy versus Jordan in elimination. Like that's as high of an honor as beating Jordan in elimination is. Uh, but using the full 360 degrees, like, you know, I'm going to do circles. I'm going to use this whole arena. They gave us a lot of space. This is like the widest balls in court I've ever seen for two fast dudes. That's kind of fun. And uh, yeah, we haven't seen a juke like that since Adam King juke Danny out of his shoes way back on, what was that, Gauntlet 3, you know, in the sand and whatever that version of, it was not balls in, but it was a uh, ball brawl, I believe it was called at that time. So yeah, incredible. Him beating Jordan, massive accomplishment. Love that they dropped the stats and the history. That's nice to see them incorporating. And love the fact that Horacio has a damn good shot to break the record. He is now tied 5-0. Five elimination wins as a rookie, tied with Sarah Grayson, Wes, and Casey from Fresh Meat 2. And 
you know, feels like he in Olivia very likely to end up in one. If there's more eliminations to be had, like if there's one or two more, very good chance he ends up in one with that shot to get number six. So I love Horacio. Horacio is an absolute total, total, total star. He and Olivia, the fact that these two come in as rookies, not just both rookie stars being as good as they are, but that they're teammates in doing all this is incredible. Huge boon for the show. Love, love, love both of them. Then we get the big twist and that we knew was coming, but we didn't think was coming this episode. And then the follow-up elimination. So first we get TJ, you know, telling him basically like, you're going to see me soon. Something's going to happen soon. Telegramming it. But then he comes the next morning. Love the reaction by bananas and Fessel out there getting their workout in TJ coming down the path. Well produced there. If they were maybe told to go out there and do that, I don't know, but uh, really, really well done as was TJ. Just the way he walks in, plops down the pool table. Like he runs the place and then tells bananas. No, this is my house. I do run this place. Love, love, love all of that. He takes him to the elimination arena and Yes, this this twist, this fake, I would have preferred not to have all the format changes. You know my stances on those. And as we just mentioned, it kind of hurt the first elimination of the night to know that this was coming. But it was really great that they just got to it this episode and that they didn't make this what we saw in 60 minutes, a full 90 minutes. I'm glad they got right to it. And TJ pulls one of his best fake outs of all time. Now, I don't know, maybe there's a chance that Anissa is just, you know, played along with it really, really well. I don't know, maybe, um, but she seems like legit. was like, yeah, we're going home. Uh, Casey seems like, yeah, we're going home here. You know, they all, everyone on the dais, everyone seems like legit faked out. So well done, great wording. Uh, whoever wrote that cue card, awesome job, TJ, amazing delivery, loved that. They bring them out and they say, you got to fight for it, which thank goodness, because there was part of me that was like, so they just, are they all three back in the game? I'm like, really? Um, again, my stance from earlier in the season, I would have preferred this be you make it to the final. And then at the final, he pulls this exact same moment of you got to have a partner to run my final. I'm sorry. And then brings them in. That would have been the best case version, possibly, I think, of this. But pretty good version here. Brings them in, tells them they got to do two eliminations or kind of says they got to do an elimination versus each other. And then the two losers will get to that. Um, but we get this elimination. I don't even remember what it's called. I don't know that I even wrote it down. Don't let me down. Yeah, there we go. Don't let me down. I did write it down. It's called don't let me down three ramps, a cylinder at the base of it, push the cylinder up, climb your feet up the ramps far enough to be above the line, hold it for one minute. And first to do so wins. This was made for Fessy and Mariah, but also shout out Fessy and Mariah for, one, not, you know, they they have some things to talk about, obviously. They, you know, Mariah has a lot of right to maybe not like the partner that she's back stuck with in this game, but they put that immediately aside and like, this is made for us. We got to get this done. This really, though, comes down to two of the three teams have the strength to push it up. And ultimately, like Casey and Kenny have plenty of the strength to push this thing up. It's being smart enough to figure out how to stand with it, with the sand and the shoes, very tricky, very difficult. The more times you fall down, the more sand you're going to take up, which turned out to be Casey and Kenny's biggest problem. Although no one really had a problem because they make the one minute that Fessel and Mariah hold it up there last for like six minutes of TV time, which uh, maybe bad choice on their part, but also maybe those two fell a bunch of times that we didn't see. I don't know. seems like it would have been more dramatic to show that if that happened. So I'm guessing... They just got it up there, held it for a minute, and it was over. <laughs> they just tried to make it more dramatic than it really was. Um, but they got the key thing. One, go up slow the first time, and you got to get locked in the first time. And the biggest thing, put your foot sideways. It helps a lot. You might roll your ankle super fucking bad. Uh, they were both on the verge of that, so that wouldn't have been good. But they avoided it, and they got the grip, and they got the win. They're in. Um, I will get to where they fall in the power rankings, but... You know, my guy Fessel, that's a daily and an limb in the same episode. Both of them, you know, one of them kind of built for him. The other, the daily, you know, not necessarily like built for anything we're supposedly think are his strengths or whatever. So, you know, good job to him. And then, of course, going into next week, we see in the next week on, it's a tiny, tiny version of Not So Fast, which I am fascinated by. And I am so excited to think about for the next week, what my strategy would be, how I would play it, whatever. We'll talk 
we already said who we think is going to win. We'll say it again in the predictions. Let's quickly, a couple, two quick hits. Just got to say, then we'll get to the awards. I know these storylines have went a lot longer than, you know, for an episode that I wasn't all that excited about a bunch of the things to talk about, but that's how we do it here. You know that. Two quick hits, though. What are you allowed to ask production to get for you? Because Horacio, great guy. Horacio gets Olivia the flowers for her birthday. That's wonderful. I love it. But all I could think about the moment he walks out with the, the flowers is like, hey, we've seen this a couple times before. They didn't let Horacio like run, you know, out to the corner store to pick up some flowers or whatever. You know, they, he asked someone or told someone or maybe they told him. I don't know. Could it could be possible. Who knows? But they knew it was her birthday. He asks or they tell him somehow, some way, someone procures from production flowers, gives them to Horacio so he can give them to Olivia. And it just has me like begging to know the answer to what are you allowed to ask for? What would they say yes to? What would they say no to? What are like the situations they're willing to say yes in versus no in? And most importantly, what is the craziest thing someone has ever asked for that they've had to say no to? Like, has my guy Nelly T like straight up asked for like a, a ring at some point been like, yo, let's turn this shit into the bachelorette right now. I'm in love. Get me a ring. Let me do the damn thing. Like, is anything wild and crazy like that where production's like, no, we're not doing that as, as, as messy and wild as that would be. We're, we're not, we're going to save you from yourself. Um, so what do they say yes to? What do they say no to? Uh, I got to know. I'm going to maybe send some DMS out to, to some different people that maybe would have an idea about that and report back if I find out anything. The other thing, that's all we get out of a party at a beach bar. Like really, seriously, one conversation between Anissa and Tori about the storyline that all of us kind of want to be over and she actively wants to be over. That's all we get out of a day of these guys hanging out on a beach, having some beers is one great song drop. Yes, we'll get to that in a second. But that's all we get out of it, man. Like, it's a bummer. You know, the days where we would go to a beachside bar with the crew and we'd have some fun and some drama and some mess and some, some good times, some entertaining. Uh, I guess those days, those are gone. As for the awards for this evening, best quote, best moment, episode MVP, and a new award that we'll get to in one moment. Best quote for the night, three nominees. First one, Fessel, about him and Tori being partnered up in a thing where TJ uses the word dancing. Quote, we've danced a time or two in the past, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And quote, the cojones <laughs> with everything Tori's going through on this season and the role he played in the small, but also, you know, sizable role he played in uh, the the aftermath of the breakup between those two and everything else. Uh, the fact that he was willing to say that is, uh, yeah, I got a good laugh. And I'm sure Tori's like, you got to be fucking kidding me. This is my nightmare never ends. My nightmare never ever ends. Never, never, ever ends. But she called him a walking mistake. He gets to make one joke about it, okay? Next nominee is Devin. Quote, call me Young Dagger. That's my hip-hop name because I'm pulling safe daggers, and it goes on and on and on. But I just liked him saying, call me Young Dagger. And also, Devin, quote, third nominee, a wrench. A wrench? And then Tori, you know, says, like, maybe a toolbox. And then Devin, how about a full Home Depot? End quote. Loved that moment between them. And again, Devin's just very good at this and uh, finds a way to impact every episode via the confessional booth, even when he's not really involved in anything else. Um, you know, but we're probably going to give this award to Fessel because uh, that was, yeah, uh, <laughs> a deserved but also brutal joke to make in the moment. Best moment. There's Jordan versus Horacio. That's number one. Uh, great elimination. Awesome matchup. Loved it, even if I set too high of expectations for it and they ruined the stakes of it with the eventual twist that we knew was coming. Number two, the way TJ came in, ignored everyone, plopped down on that pool table, loved everything about that. Then the third and final one and the winner, because for as much as sometimes I dislike and don't want all the twists and turns and everything, at least make them good, make the, you know, the moment of them really great. And TJ's fake out does actually work here. And again, maybe Anissa just knows to play along and the rest of them kind of play along with it. Maybe they're all getting to be better actors at this point. I don't know, but it seemed like it really, really worked. The wording was perfect. I liked it. That's the moment of the episode. New award quickly. 
Uh, I've been thinking about it all season, but most episodes it's been like, oh, that's a clear winner, and I like make it in my notes, but I don't actually say it on the podcast. Best needle drop. The music this season has been off the charts great. I want the soundtrack. It's amazing. This episode, two nominees. I can't believe there's two of them because the first one is Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe when they head to the beach bar party. Uh, that turned out to just be uh, an emotional, dramatic uh, conversation between Anissa and Tori, and that was it. But the lead-in and all of them kind of dancing or Devin you know, slinging back a beer to Call Me Maybe was awesome. Loved hearing that. Didn't think that could be top, but then Avicii's levels for when the eliminated folks return. Loved both. Uh, both very important songs to me, and pretty much these might have been from like the same year in college. Levels was, def- yeah, these were both, I think, they were within one year of each other. These songs came out. Maybe Levels was a little earlier. I don't I don't know. College was a blur. But they both came out around my junior year of college. So I'm going to lean towards Carly Rae pretty much any time. And every time, episode MVP, TJ's got to get a shout-out. Fifth place, TJ. Incredible episode for TJ. Devin, as always, gets a shout-out. He's in fourth place. He had those quotes. Also, the, am I going to pick a professional soccer player or a triathlete with a bad attitude? That was an amazing line. That could have been you know in the quote of the week. Jordan and Tori tied for third. They're wrapped up together, even in, you know, getting votes for MVP of the episode. Horacio second, Fessel first. Horacio, yes, made the history. Yes, beat Jordan. But technically, Fessel also beat Jordan in elimination in this episode and won the daily challenge in this elimination or in this episode and uh, had some good quotes and everything else. And so I'm giving him the nod because that's just what we do here at this program. Finally, we've got power rankings to update, and it's a big update because we're back to the pairs, baby, where we should have been the whole time, probably, but we're back to where this show works its best in male-female pairs. That is the best format, or is the, the format with the highest ceiling and the highest floor. So, new, totally, totally new power rankings from where they were before, and but also kind of back to where they were prior to them going to teams, which is to say, small shakeup. Prior to them going to teams, it was always Devin Torrey 1, Bananas 92. Flip that around. Bananas 90 number 1. Like, this is this is Bananas' moment to seize CT not being there. Get that 8th. Try to put a little distance. Try to reclaim that spot as definitively maybe the GOAT. His chance for Nani to get that first win. They, they've got a real nice setup with the, you know, the, whatever version of the six teams that are left are left. Uh, better setup, obviously, if Casey and Kenny win. But even if it's Jordan and Anissa, um, there's a different setup, but still a good one for Bananas and Nani. Devin and Tori in two. Love that they're back together. That's going to help Tori especially a lot. And really Devin a lot. Fessel and Mariah three. Amber Chauncey four. Olivia Horacio five. Really, I don't know what to do there. Amber's a champion, and I want to respect that. But also, I don't know who's going to do the puzzle on their team if they run into it. And I feel like I want to put Olivia and Horacio above them. But they're rookies. They're going to probably go into elimination, probably verse each other. So I don't know. They're basically tied is what I'm saying. Casey and Kenny in sixth because, as we'll get to, my prediction is that they are the ones still in the game. But even if they are not, Jordan and Nisa, I would maybe put it in just tied in that group. Amber Chauncey, Olivia Horacio, Jordan and Nisa. Tie, tie ball game between them. They're all looking up at the other three teams. I just kind of see a two-tier system here. As for the preseason predictions, those stay. Those are still good. Still got the three teams plus the winners. You know, so that's what we've had for a while. Still doing pretty good. My predictions from last week going into this week, I said balls in on a guy's day. That would be the tonight. That was the case. I said the nighttime challenge, which was correct. I also said hopefully it was the spooky town, but that wasn't part of the actual prediction, so I did get it right. And then the third one was I said the rider dies return would be the cliffhanger, and thank goodness I'm so happy to have got that wrong that they went right to it. They at least kept it moving right into it. So two for three. As for next week, I've said it three, four, five, six, 18 times by now, but I got Kenny and Casey winning the elimination round uh mostly because it feels like they like really put everything last drop they had into the Tory Jordan thing and uh that those would be going home but if that happens and possibly when it happens like that's going to be three elimination losses in 24 hours for Jordan and that's going to be four straight elimination losses for Jordan now going back to his loss in Mark on All-Stars 3 and uh yeah that puts that puts a damper on the resume, like in a pretty significant way, like in a really, really significant way. So 
That's going to be tough. We'll see. I, again, am so thrilled for this mini night, not, uh, uh, not so fast. I just, I'm floored by the fact that they're doing it this way. This is incredible. If you didn't watch the next week on, sorry, I spoiled it, but they're playing not so fast, but in, with a like tiny, like three foot by three foot or some like tall, small, small, maybe four or five foot by five foot, but smaller than not as tall as any of the competitors doing it. Small little square cage that you go in and out of, which is why I think Casey Kenny, a little more dexterity amongst that team and uh, ultimately probably going to work together a lot better than Jordan and Nisa being paired back together. And Anissa maybe just wanting to go the fuck home at this point. She's like, I got my check. I was here plenty of episodes. This is, we're good. We can get it, keep it moving. So they'll win. Devin and Tori will win the daily challenge. Horacio will get his chance for the record setting sixth elimination win. That would be incredible. I'm not saying whether you'll win or lose. I'm predicting he will get the chance. He will be going into elimination. Devin and Tori will win the daily challenge. Casey and Kenny will win the eliminations. Those are the predictions, and that's everything for this very long podcast episode about an episode that, while only 90 minutes, felt pretty long because we got a little extra than normal, but I'm glad they went the route that they did, and it wasn't just 90 minutes to get to that balls in elimination. So, that's all for tonight. As always, hit me up on Instagram at Challenge Historian if you want to chop it up about the challenge, if you got thoughts about this podcast, anything of that nature. As always, hit that follow, subscribe, like, rate, review, five stars only, please, and thank you wherever you may be listening or watching. Those are super duper helpful. I will be back again next week for Ride or Dies, that Challenge 39 fancy cast coming that following Friday. I am going to start to get, you know, we we got the TikTok and the Instagram going a little bit last week. I got a big travel here coming up the next five days. So, uh, we'll, you know, that was a little test. Like, can I do it? Can I actually start making some short form social media content again? Yes, the answer was yes. And so we're going to get back to a bunch of that as well starting next week. So that's the plan. Thanks for being here as always. Much love, much appreciation. Talk to you soon. Peace.